the Dome Fund study, uh, and Dome Fund of course you knows that not only is this in China, uh, but it's also very, very famous for uh, Chan Buddhism. But professors, uh, uh, one Skype's work is particularly noted both uh, because he focused on uh, Tibetan traditions. And so this made our uh, pride become even more, uh, more universal. <laughs> uh, so uh, Wu Jian's work has made this work on Chinese and Japanese uh, Chan traditions. But now we are very happy to see that and this prize now might go to a uh, Tibetan. Uh, Professor San, Wang, uh, San Skype is the head of uh, Endangered Archives programs and is a British library, which is, uh, facilitates the, the digitalizations of archives and manuscripts around the world that are at the risk of deteriorations or de uh, destructions. He received his PhDs in Tibetan study from the University of uh, Manchester out of which he worked for the International Dome Farm Projects at the uh, British Library, where his researches encompassed Tibetan tantric practice, earned then the studies of Buddhist manuscript cultures and the spread of Buddhism around the Silk Route. His publications include Tibet Histories, uh, which is come from Yale uh, University Press in 2011, uh, Tibetan Zen, uh, from Snow Lions, uh, and this is in four, uh, four years later, and this one, The Spirits of Zen, also from Yale uh, University Press, and uh, uh, this is very, very new, so one year news. Uh, he has a forthcoming book entitled Buddhist Magic, uh, to be uh, uh, scheduled for publications next year. Someone's guy's book, The Spirits of Zen, is the first truly remarkable new book in English to have been published in the areas of Chang, Song, Zen study since the Zen traditions and transitions. What makes one guy's book, uh, The Spirits of Zen's Approachables, is part one, which is provides not only a concise, readable, and well researched overviews of the histories and practices of Zen, but also introduced the main subjects of this book and translations of the Master of Lanka. This is uh, also used to be my, my, my <laughs> uh, very major uh, topic uh, when I was a graduate student at McMaster. <laughs> so I'm very happy that uh, you revisit this, uh, this tech by providing a, a convincing and coherent explanations of why the discoveries of the caches of uh, documents find at Dong Fang continue to transform the stories of Zen Buddhism today. Furthermore, the spirits of Zen focus on a topic that scholars have endeavored for decades to excise from the Chang Zhong Zen studies lexicon, meditations. Put simply, how to med meditate is not the focus of all. Uh, it's not only the focus of almost all Chinese, Chan, Korean songs and Japanese Buddhist texts, writ uh, written or published from roughly 752, uh, 750, uh, uh, 55 to uh, uh, nine, uh, to the uh, the uh, beginnings of the 20th centuries. One Skype explains this fact in plain languages, alluding to um, providing short selections from only the few foundational, well-studied texts in order to highlight the significance of the masters of Lanka as well examples of an early 8th century Chang or Zen text, primarily about how to meditate. Yet, the introductions and overviews that are accessible to almost anyone who can read English are not what make the spirit of Zen admirable. Part two contains the news translations and source studies of the Master of Lanka using all available 10th century Dome Fund documents in Chinese and the earlier 8th century Tibetan translation. Con uh, Concomitantly, one guy's tacos or collectives 
The translations from Chinese into English by, the, uh, for example, uh, clearly uh, published his translations published in uh, in eighty six, right? Uh, quite uh, quite old, and French is by Bernard Faure, uh three years later. Using the groundbreaking research on this text by Yanagita Seizan, that eighth floor, and uh, remedies the problems with the Chinese editions with his translation from the Tibetan. Right, this is very, very, very remarkable. But there is more. The translations of the Masters of Lankas in one sky to the spirit of Jens also address the main points first made in English in D.T. studies in the Lanka Vajra Sutra and again in John McCray's Northern School and Formations of Early Charm Buddhism and yet again in Bernard Ford's The Wheel to, uh, to uh, Orthodoxies, a critical genealogy of Northern Charm Buddhism. That the Lankavatara uh, sorry, the Lankavatara Sutra was clearly once the keys to charm meditation practice. Gunabhadra, the translators are the first and most widely read translations into Chinese, and the other six Patrick are presented here as the masters of meditations. They almost certainly were to uh, medieval Chinese and Tibetan Buddhist. Uh, Buddhist and will becomes for readers of the Spirit of Zen. Once Christ's book, the Spirit of Zen introduced a new generation of readers to why the stories of Zen justify both is in the name, or uh, Zen or Chan or Song, means meditations, and we must not forget this. So now, let me introduce professors Shan one sky uh, to deliver his uh, uh, lectures. Thank you. Sorry, I think I, I, I got confused on this uh, uh, procedures. Uh, I think we should uh, give you this certificate before you. Otherwise, there's no reason for you to give the lecture. <laughs> 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 thank, you. thank you very much. And also, thank you for the uh, Friday's uh, hour, the oh, ocean, okay. to thank give you this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to all for the very kind words and uh, you know, probably a better summary of my book than, uh, than I can possibly give. Uh, I really want to say thanks to you and to Tianju uh, Network for the honor of, of this prize and for also uh, inviting me here to talk. Uh, it's a really great experience and it's lovely to be here um, and talk to you a bit about this book which uh, um, I wrote uh, in an attempt to get something across about how the Dunhuang manuscripts connect with the practice of Zen uh, across the world uh, and how uh, we can kind of learn from these manuscripts, not just kind of about history and about early texts, but about, about practice, about meditation uh, in the early Zen traditions. So, very briefly, uh, uh, I want to acknowledge the help and support of some friends and colleagues. Uh, Imre Gallenbosch, in particular, encouraged me to learn and translate classical Chinese and uh, also read my translation uh, in this book before it was published. Uh, the British Library, Susan Whitfield and uh, Melody Dumi helped with my access to Chinese Dunhuang manuscripts. Uh, and also, fortuitously, Marcus Bingenheimer was working on uh, editions of uh, Charm texts from Dunhuang uh, at the same time as, as I was doing this work, and, and they were very helpful as well. Um, and although I've never met them, I want to send out thanks to Jonathan Cleary and Bernard Faure, who Dunhuang mentioned, had earlier translated this work uh, in their own publications. And finally, I wanted to acknowledge the support and encouragement of John McRae for my own earlier work on Tibetan Zen. So I wrote The Spirit of Zen as part of a series published by Yale University Press to introduce religious traditions from 
primary sources. And my aim was to use some early sources of Zen from Dunhuang to, as a basis for an introduction to the wide range of traditions that later developed under the heading of Zen. At the same time, I was driven by my own curiosity about what these people from the early Zen lineages, who were known as meditation teachers, were actually teaching. I'd already published a book of translations of Tibetan Zen texts, including the Zen lineage history, the record of the masters and students of the Lanka. The title is a translation of the Chinese Leng Jia Shizhe Yi, and in this talk I'll be using the shortened form, The Masters of the Lanka. So I came to see this text as a source book for meditation techniques. And when I came to write The Spirit of Zen, I decided to make a complete translation of the text based on both the Chinese and the Tibetan versions. This is one uh, example of uh, Dunhuang scroll of the Chinese text in the British Library. And to some extent, I wanted to talk about the relation of these texts to meditation in the later Zen tradition. Here I'm using the word Zen as a kind of umbrella term uh, to cover the range, range of related traditions across uh, Asia, known as Chan, Sion, or Samten in Tibet. And all of these terms, as you'll know, derive from the Sanskrit jhana, which we often translate to meditation. This is the Tibetan text of the Masters of the Lanka. So the text itself, the Masters of the Lanka, dates back to the 8th century. And we only know about it thanks to the manuscripts that were sealed in the Dunhuang Cave in China's Gansu province. These manuscripts were discovered at the beginning of the 20th century, having been closed in some 900 years earlier, at the beginning of the 11th century. There were thousands of manuscripts in the cave, many of which belonged to individual Buddhist monks and monastic officials. A small but significant group of the manuscripts were concerned with the masters and the teachings of early Zen. And it's fair to say that these manuscripts revolutionized people's understanding of the early history of Zen Buddhism. The Masters of the Lanka is one of the most important of these rediscovered texts. It was clearly popular in Dunhuang, as it appears in 13 different scrolls and scroll fragments dating from the 9th and 10th centuries, as well as this Tibetan translation. And this work differs from the other early Zen lineage texts in its focus on the content of the Master's teachings rather than their life stories. Across the different chapters, there's no single orthodox teaching. Instead, the text brings together trends that were emerging in meditation practice at the time. We cannot be sure whether the works attributed to each individual master in each chapter really were taught by them, and scholars have come to different conclusions about this. But we do know this selection of meditation practices was circulating and popular in the 8th century. So, the Master of the Lanka begins with a preface by a Zen monk called Jing Zhui, in which he writes about how he came to be a Buddhist monk and how he achieved a high level of realization thanks to his two meditation teachers. He goes on to offer an eloquent and profound exposition of the path to awakening. He also gives an extensive presentation of the meaning of emptiness. And it's worth saying here that these early writers did not see themselves as following a particular kind of Buddhism called Chan or Zen. Rather, they saw themselves as followers of a special line of Buddhist teachers who specialized in meditation. After the preface, the Master of the Zalanka goes back to the beginning of the lineage in China. And uh, as uh, Chunhua mentioned, unlike most Zen lineage texts, it begins not with Bodhidharma, but with Gunabhadra the Indian scholar who, in the 5th century, traveled to China and translated the Lanka Tara Sutra. That was already a contentious move which was criticized in some other early Zen lineage texts. And in the text, there's no personal connection between Gudabhadra and Bodhidharma. The connection is the Lanka Tara Sutra itself. In the text, Bodhidharma takes the Lanka Tara as the basis of his own teachings and hands it on to his own student, Hui Ke. Bodhidharma's classic text, The Two Entrances and Four Practices, is included here in full. And then it's followed in the Master of the Lanka by uh, the next generation, carrying forward the teaching of the Lanka Vatara. After Bodhidharma comes Sweka, and then Sang Tsang. Uh, and apart from the place of these two in the Zen lineage, their teachings are, uh, are not particularly uh, given at length, and uh, we don't know that much about them. In contrast, the next section on the teacher Dao Xin is by far the longest and comprises a lengthy treatise and several miscellaneous pieces on meditation practice. This is really the centerpiece of the Masters of the Lanka. 
After him comes Hongren, who founded the East Mountain teaching tradition, and of his many students, the Masters of the Lanka focuses on Chen Xiu, who was to become famous when he was favoured by the Empress Wu Setian. The final part of the text is briefly some of Chen Xiu's students taking us full circle to the generation of Jing Zhui, the author of the preface. Now, some recent studies of these early Zen lineage texts see them as having a, mainly a political purpose for promoting particular teachers and lineages. And while there's no doubt some truth in that approach, uh, it could be quite limiting, I find, especially in the case of a text like the Masters of the Lanka. When we look at the Dunhuang manuscripts of this text, other interesting questions arise that are not just about politics. Why do we see so many copies of them in circulation in the late 10th century? Who was using them? And for what purpose? One clue is found uh, in the manuscript containing the Tibetan text. On the other side of this, there's a different Tibetan text written for teachers about how to guide their students in meditation. This text has advice for meditation teachers. Uh, for example, teachers should stay with their students as they meditate, asking them about their practice and state of mind and getting to know them thoroughly. If they receive correction early on, they, as the students, will certainly get to the point, get to the point of meditation. So, some very practical teaching on, directed at uh, teachers on how to guide their students. We don't know the author of this text, or whether it was originally written in Tibetan or Chinese, but we do know that it was copied uh, and used alongside that text of the Masters of the Lang. So I think it's reasonable cons to consider whether the copies of the Masters of the Lanka were also written down as a resource for meditation teachers and their students. Many of the copies of the text in Chinese are quite rough and were probably written in a teaching situation. With this in mind, I think it's worthwhile considering whether the teachings of the Masters of the Lanka could be an early example of what early teachers and students in Zen lineages were talking about when they discussed and practiced meditation. So as I mentioned, the most detailed instructions in the Masters of the Lanka on how to sit in meditation are found in Daoshin's chapter. This chapter includes the complete text of Daoshin's Dharma teachings for the Bodhisattva precepts, which begins with a teaching on a meditation practice called the Single Practice Concentration. This is a form of meditation that is focused on visualizing a Buddha and reciting their name. Daoshin begins his teaching on this practice with a quote from a sutra. This is the key passage from the sutra describing the actual single practice concentration. Focus your mind on a single Buddha and only recite their name. With an upright posture facing towards the place where the Buddha resides, stay constantly mindful of this single Buddha. In this state of mind, you will be able to see mm -hmm. every Buddha of the past and future clearly manifest. This gives a clear passage of the practice that Daoshin is teaching. You focus your mind on a Buddha of choice. This would probably be involved visualization, a practice that was already well known in China at the time. Uh, at the same time, you recite the name of the Buddha over and over again. You sit upright and face towards the direction where that Buddha resides. The pure realms of the Buddhas are associated with a particular direction, the most famous being Amitabha's pure land in the West. But Daoshin wants to revise these meditation instructions in his own version of the single practice concentration. For one thing, he sees no reason to face any specific direction. Once you know that mind from the start has never arisen or ceased to be, and has always been pure, then you know that it is identical with the pure lands of the Buddhas, so there's no longer any need to face the pure land in the West. That is to say, if the pure land is found in your own mind, it doesn't matter which way you face. On the other hand, Daoshin does not apply this to every meditator. It's only for those who have an understanding of the nature of their mind. For those people, the key point is that the pure land is present here and now. Daoshin goes on to say that the Pure Land is exactly the same as this realm, but entirely free from clinging. So, when one's mind is no longer grasping, one is experiencing the Pure Land. Incidentally, this line reminds me of one of the sayings from the Coptic Gospel of Thomas. The kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, yet people do not see it. In any case, though Daoshin questions the idea that one has to face the West uh, or any direction, he doesn't challenge the basic practice itself reciting the Buddha's name while visualizing his or her form in one's mind. This practice of mindfulness of the Buddha is Nyanfo in Chinese, Nyambutsu in Japan. It's a practice that's strongly associated with the Pure Land schools. 
this kind of practice actually continued in Zen monasteries in China over the centuries. And when people discuss this fact, they usually talk about syncretism and about Zen teachers incorporating popular practices into their traditions. But the Masters of the Lanka shows that as far back as we can go, Zen meditation teaching included visualizing, visualizing and reciting the name of the Buddha. Or to put it another way, nobody combined the pre-existing form of Zen meditation with other types of practice like Pure Land meditation. Zen meditation emerged from these practices. It's clear that the early teachers and students in these traditions embraced a range of practices. That said, not all meditation practices are equal. For Daoshin, practicing mindfulness of the Buddha is not an end in itself. The purpose is to get to the point where one is meditating without focusing on anything, a state of mind called mindfulness without an object. When you're mindful of the Buddha continuously through every state of mind, it will simply become clear and calm, and mindfulness will no longer be based on perceptual objects. This state is perhaps closer to what is taught as mindfulness nowadays. So it's interesting to see that a seasoned meditation teacher in the early years of Zen Buddhism didn't teach this kind of mindfulness without an object straight away. Mindfulness without an object was the culmination of the practice of mindfulness with an object, the visualized form of the Buddha, and recited sound of the Buddha's name. The progression to mindfulness without an object is organic, for Daoshan explains that the Buddha is no different from one's mind. Therefore, mindfulness of the Buddha is really mindfulness of one's own mind, which is mindfulness without an object. I won't read that because what I just said. This mindfulness without an object leads to a state of mind free from grasping and dualistic thinking. Daoshin concludes, when you reach this stage, mindfulness of the Buddha fades away as it's no longer needed. So the meditation technique of visualizing a Buddha and reciting their name is to be practiced, but it's also eventually left behind in the realization of non-duality. Thus, according to Daoshan's meditation teaching in the Master of the Lanka, the meditator eventually reaches the point when all techniques are dropped. There remains a kind of technique that is not a technique, which he calls observing the mind in Chinese Kan Xin. Daoshan explains in detail how to actually assume the meditation posture and breathing. Indeed, these are among the most detailed such instructions in early, early Zen. To begin, sit with your body upright in comfortable clothes without a belt. Relax your body and loosen your arms and legs by rubbing them seven or eight times. Allow your mind to come to rest in your abdomen and let your breath out completely. This is clearly an instruction on breathing from the abdomen, in which one's concentration is moved down to the point in the body, called fu in Chinese, hara in Japanese. Breathing in and out of the abdomen and allowing one's consciousness to descend to that point in the body is taught by modern Zen teachers too as well as in other contemplative martial arts and medical traditions. As Daoshi makes clear, observing the mind does not mean examining or analyzing. Daoshi makes this point in pithy instructions written in four character meter. Don't be mindful of the Buddha, don't control the mind, don't examine the mind, don't speculate about the mind, don't deliberate, don't practice analysis, don't become distracted, just let it be. Obviously, most of these instructions are about what not to do. The meditator has dropped the practice of mindfulness of the Buddha. That space is not to be filled with trying to control, examine, or analyze the mind, but also one is not to wander off in distraction. The key phrase here is, just let it be. The Chinese term, Ren Yun, literally means accept one's fate. Thus, this practice of observing the mind means remaining in a state of awareness without getting distracted, but also without attempting to control the mind. The practice of, of observing the mind continued to be popular in the generation of teachers who followed Daoshin, and it can be found in the work of other teachers preserved in the Dunhuang manuscripts. For example, Mohiyan, whose works were translated into Tibetan, also taught this kind of meditation, saying, sit with crossed legs and body without sleeping from evening till dawn. Then whatever thoughts arise should not be designated as moving or not moving, as existing or not existing, as virtuous or non-virtuous, as defiled or pure. When you observe the mind in this way, it has no nature. Daoshin considers this practice of observing the mind to be an advanced one, not appropriate to all students of meditation. It results 
in a direct realization of the nature of mind. And Daoshin says, if you can truly observe the mind in this way, you will directly apprehend mind's luminosity. Mind's luminosity and clarity, which are like a bright, bright mirror. The crucial role of the meditation teacher is to decide whether this kind of advanced practice is appropriate for a particular student or not. Thus, the way students attain this realization is not always the same, and these differences are due to the fact that currently their inner faculties and outer conditions are not the same. A person who wants to be a teacher must be capable of recognizing these differences. This eminently practical advice is crucial for understanding early Zen teachings. All we really need to do is rest in the flow of awareness without analyzing or controlling it or becoming distracted. But this is difficult, and so other methods such as visualization, intellectual analysis are taught as preliminaries to help students reach the point where they can simply be aware. Another meditation practice in the Masters of the Lanka does something that we usually consider to be a hallmark of tantric or esoteric Buddhism. The meditator imaginatively recreates the experience of being a Buddha in their own body and environment. Daoshin teaches a practice in which the meditator performs a classic Buddhist deconstruction of the body into its physical and mental components. The emptiness of the body means it has no essence, nothing that constitutes me. When the meditator divides up the body into these different parts, nothing remains but the parts, and all of these parts are impermanent. Then the meditator looks at the body from the point of view of enlightenment, imagining their own body as empty and clear like a reflection, and endowed with wisdom, which is also like a reflection. This enlightened body, the body of a Buddha, spontaneously responds to the needs of beings without being limited by space. And a similar kind of practice is described in Hong Wen's chapter in the Masters of the Lanka, beginning with a simple relaxation and visualization practice. When you sit, let your face relax, and sit with your head and body straight. Finally, let go of your body and mind, resting in emptiness, visualize the single syllable. The single syllable is a term most commonly found in tantric literature occurring in a number of esoteric texts in the Chinese canon. In the esoteric tradition, the syllable that is visualized is usually the syllable pa, the first letter of the Sanskrit alphabet, which emerges from the state of emptiness. The visualization of the single syllable then expands into a vast and spacious visualization, this is in Hong Ren, in which the meditator imagines him or herself on top of a mountain. After you have mastered this, when you're sitting, imagine that you are in green countryside. In the middle, there is a solitary mountain, you're sitting out in the open on top of the mountain, looking in the four directions, seeing far into the distance without barriers or boundaries. As you sit, you fill the whole world, your body and mind free and spacious, abiding in the realm of the Buddhas. The striking visualization is not just to generate a sense of spaciousness and clarity. As Hong Wen says, when the meditator is in this imagined state of filling the whole world, they are already in the state of being a Buddha. There is an echo of this practice in Hongwen's last words as recorded in his chapter in the Masters of the Lanka. Uh, it says, the great master then raised his hand and gestured towards the ten directions, each time stating that the realized mind was already there. These possible overlaps of the Masters of the Lanka with esoteric Buddhism have not really been explored. Now one thing that has caught the attention of scholars is that their text contains something that looks like early koan teaching. As these scholars have generally concluded, these are not koans per se, but they might be the seeds out of which the koan literature grew. In the later tradition, almost every koan comes from a story of an encounter between a teacher and disciple, and most from an exchange of questions and answers. In the Masters of the Lanka, we have teaching situations with questions asked by masters, although not the students' answers. These questions appear at the end of the chapters on Gunabhadra, Bodhidharma, Hongren, and Shansu. For several reasons, it's doubtful that Gunabhadra or Bodhidharma actually use these teaching techniques. It's more credible that it might have begun with Hongren or Shen Xiu, and it was certainly becoming more widespread in the generation of their students. The question in the Masters of Alanka are like some later columns in that they do not allow easy answers. They're clearly meant to throw students off track, challenge their conventional understanding of things. A teaching technique attributed in the text of Bodhidharma illustrates how this would work. The great teacher would point his finger at something and ask what it really was. He would just point at a single object and call upon someone to stand up and question him about that object. Then he would ask the whole group about the object, substituting another name for the object and asking whether it had changed. Pointing at an object and asking students what it really is poses an unanswerable question. 
Changing the name of the object looks like a way of breaking down the student's conventional understanding of the link between the signifier and signified. Does a thing change if we call it by another name? This technique also appears in the chapters on Gunabhadra, Hongwei and Shansiu, where the question they always ask is, what is this? He used to go up to objects and ask a question. For example, he would point to a leaf on a tree and ask, what is this? Also seeing a bird fly past, he would ask, what is this? The simple question, what is this, in Chinese, Wu He, is applied to an everyday object or an image such as Hongwen's Wu. Uh, and in the teaching context, it's clear that the obvious answer, uh, a bird or a leaf, will not suffice. And this brings about a situation of uncertainty uh, and doubt, turning the focus back to the question itself. This procedure does look very much like an ancestor of the later koan practice, uh, very much like the key phrases, hoa tuo, the most famous of which is the contemplation of the word no, wu, as an answer to the question, does the dog have the Buddha image? The conventional answer should be yes, so the word no brings about a state of doubt. And in contemporary Zen, there's also a key phrase, what is this? The phrase comes from a story about Hui Nang and his student, Hui Ran. When the latter first visited Hui Nang, he asked, what is it that comes? Having contemplated the question for years, Hui Ran gave his answer, to explain or demonstrate anything would miss the mark. Thus, what is this? Is a question which points to the lack of an answer. Another kind of question, challenges students' assumptions about the distinction between conventional categories like inside and outside, as in the following attributed to Chen Siu. In this room there is a jar. Isn't this jar outside the room as well? Isn't the water in the jar? Isn't the water jar in the water? Indeed, from the greatest to the smallest of the various rivers and streams, aren't each and every one of them in this jar? Again, the fact there's no possible answer except the most obvious and banal, no, the jar is not outside the room as well, throws the attention back on the students' basic assumptions. A similar question with a striking resemblance to another famous koan is attributed to Chen Tzu. It is taught in the Nirvana Sutra that the Bodhisattva's body has no periphery, yet he came from the East. Since the Bodhisattva's body has no periphery or boundary, I ask again, did he come from the East? Why could he not have come from the West, or from the South, or North? Are they not equally possible? The famous curl that this brings to mind is the uh, question, why did the patriarch come from the West? The question refers to Bodhidharma's journey from India, which was considered to lie to the West along the Silk Road. On the other hand, Chen Siu's question refers to the Buddha himself, who is said in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra to have come from Eastern India. Yet the Buddha, as the embodiment of the enlightened state, cannot be restricted to any place or time. As we have seen in the visualization practices attributed to Daoshin and Hongren, the body of a Buddha is limitless space. Other questions of the Master of the Lanka query basic concepts and categories more directly. Does this body exist? Is this body a body? Does this mind have a mind? Is your mind really a mind? When you see forms, do they have form? Are forms really forms? In the background, all of these questions is emptiness. In Mahayana Buddhism, all categories, including existence and non-existence, are empty, in that they only work in dependence on each other. This is pointed out in a teaching attributed to Hong Ren. Once he picked up two fire tongs, one long and one short, held them up side by side and asked, which is long, which is short? These metal tongs were probably those used in hearths and braziers, and in modern Japan, still used in tea ceremonies. They vary from roughly 25 centimeters to 40 centimeters in size. So in this example, we can imagine Hongwen might have had two tongs of different sizes from different sets. He might have held them up and asked his students, how are you so sure which one is long and which one is short? Isn't the long one only long when we hold it up next to the short one? In one of the most popular books, on Zen, Zen and the Art of Archery, Yugen Herigel described his lessons in archery with a Japanese teacher, Awa Kenzo, as a way of attaining Zen realization. In recent years, Japanese scholars have shown that Herigel's account is a mixture of misunderstandings and wishful thinking. His teacher, Awa Kenzo, might have had an interest in Zen, but he never taught archery as a way to attain the understanding of Zen. So I found it interesting that archery does play a role in Daoshan's teachings from the Masters of the Lang. Listen to your practice properly and without even a moment of doubt. Be like a person learning to shoot an arrow. They begin with a large target and they aim at a small target. They aim at a large circle and they aim at a small circle. 
then aim at a single piece of twine, and then they split the twine into a hundred threads and aim at one of the hundred threads. Then they shoot the arrow into the previous one, so the arrow is fixed in the knot, preventing both arrows from falling. This is not an instruction, obviously, to practice archery, but archery becomes a metaphor for gradual practice. Daoshan is advising his audience, composed of people who've just received the vows of the Bodhisattva, and therefore just beginning their meditation practice, to take it slowly. As somebody learning archery begins with large targets and gradually moves on to smaller and smaller ones, beginners starting meditation should not try the most advanced practices from the start. And if hitting a single thread seems difficult, Daoshan goes on to describe an even more advanced practice and they shoot their arrow into the previous one so that the arrows kind of hold each other up uh, in the center of the um, target. The image here is the archer hitting the arrow that he's just shot uh, uh, and splitting it all the way down. Uh, actually, I, I had a look, a little research into this, and in the West, it's a feat known as the Robin Hood. It's one word uh, coming after the achievement shown in the 1938 film, The Adventures of Robin Hood. So it is possible, and uh, one imagines with bamboo arrows, it would also be possible to achieve. But what does it mean? What does it have to do with meditation practice? Dalton explains that as a stream of consciousness flows through the mind, every moment of mind is continuous without the briefest interval. Thus, mindfulness is like a sequence of arrows stuck in the knock of the previous one without a break. Dalton employs some other images to emphasize the need to practice meditation constantly not stopping or starting. For example, if you want to make a fire, you'll have to keep rubbing the sticks together. If you stop and start, the fire will not come. Thus, for Daoshin, meditation practice requires complete dedication. Yet, at the same time, practice is just a means to an end. Though the ocean of Dharma may be immeasurable, it can be crossed with a single teaching. Once you have grasped the intention, the teaching can be forgotten, for even a single teaching is of no use anymore. Once the intention of the teachings is understood, the words can be forgotten, the words themselves are provisional. Daoshin seems here to be alluding to a passage in the Tao's classic uh, Zhuangzi. Oh, hang on, it's not there. Oh, I'm missing one. Okay, I'll just read it to you. The fish trap is there for the fish. When you've got hold of the fish, you forget the trap. A snare is there for the rabbits. When you have got hold of the rabbit, you forget the snare. Words are there for the intent. When you've got hold of the intent, you forget the words. There's also a, a, a quote from uh, Wittgenstein's uh, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus at the end, a famous one about uh, once you've got to the end and you've, uh, you don't need his, his uh, text anymore, like you can discard the ladder once you've reached the point that you needed to climb to. Um, the idea that the teachings are merely a means to an end uh, also has a strong tradition in earlier Buddhism, of course, as expressed through the concept of skillful means. If all is empty and nothing is inherently true, this also gives, goes to the Dharma, in which case the teachings should be selected as appropriate to each individual student. I would suggest that this idea of skillful means infuses the whole approach to meditation in the Masters of Alanka. The patchwork nature of the text means that each teacher's presentation of meditation is different. What holds them together is merely the act of teaching meditation, along with the idea that the Buddha is already present in the mind, so there should be no attachment to any specific form of meditation. I'll finish with a couple of last quotes, this time from the text which is on the other side of the Tibetan manuscript of the Master of the Lanka again. As I mentioned earlier, this text is concerned with how to instruct students in meditation. The anonymous author writes that Meditating on the same thing may not be suitable for each and every mind. In their confusion, some people are happy, some wild, some drowsy, while others are a mixture. Therefore, the author says, the meditation teacher should be like a doctor, describing what works for each individual. On the other hand, the true meaning of meditation is entirely beyond any specific meditation technique, because there's no cause to be achieved or result to be attained. So at some point, all techniques come to an end. And that seems a good place to end tonight as well. <laughs> Thank you.